but it's much easier if you just install 2.2 side by side if, if you have 2.3 installed. And there are links, uh, I think there are in the project description as well to uh, Orleans SDK and download and install from and the samples like the CodePlex site with samples discussions. There's a lot of useful information there. And links to other like blog posts and, and a lot of information like that. So just, just a quick re recap of what we covered yesterday. So the goal of Orleans is to make uh, developer productivity uh, much better, to reduce this complexity of building distributed uh, scalable cloud uh, systems, to address these issues of concurrency, distribution, partitioning, distributed coordination, things like that, and to make code that, that people write scalable by default so that they can increase the load on the system by 10 times, 100 times, hopefully by 1,000 times, and still not re have to rewrite the whole application. So another quick recap of what grains are, the virtual actors. So that's why we, we call them grains and not just actors to highlight that we have a, a concrete set of properties. In particular, what's different from other actor model implementations is automatic activation uh, and, and deactivation so that you never create or, or delete objects explicitly. You just get the reference to them and you can make a call which sends the message under the covers and activation and garbage collection of unused actors is done uh, by the runtime. So because of that, grains never fail. They kind of virtually always exist. Only individual request calls, method calls to grains may fail, but grains never disappear. So it's a very different uh, mental model for people that are used to creating things explicitly, like we create objects and then delete and pass the references around. It's almost the same, except you don't create them. You, you can get a reference and pass it around, persist it, in the database uh, send as a reference, but the, the target that this reference points to, it never uh, disappears, never gets created or deleted. And of course, location transparency is expected in any uh, distributed systems these days. So we'll look at uh, Hello World, uh, very trivial example here. So this is a more elaborate um, example. Unfortunately, it's cut off. Let me see if I can change resolution quickly because when looking at code it's important to see everything not just the beginning uh, let's see. so let's see if we go to a terrible resolution it will look better Is it better? Okay, so you always start with Orleans, you always start with defining interface uh, for, for your, your grain. So this is like IDL, interface definition language in, in COM, very analogous. Or I know you deal with web services, they have this WSDL language. So conceptually it's the same, except for you define it just like for any uh, local uh, .NET, C Sharp, Java interface. It's very very simple, you don't need to write any kind of separate language like IDL or, or WSDL. And you mark your interface as, as it extends iGrain, just the marker interface. That, that's the indication that you're defining grain interface. And then you define asynchronous methods. I asked you yesterday to look at TPL and async await, so I hope you did you spend last night reading up on TPL and how it works. So task is, is the uh, primitive that the task parallel library uses for asynchrony. You see all these methods, they return either a task, like set name returns a task. That's kind of a return of void, promise for a void result, meaning this task, the object that gets uh, returned, will be resolved when operation, remote operation completes. Not necessarily remote, but asynchronous operation completes. The task of a string, for example, when you get name, that, that promise for a string result will be resolved when the response comes back, when operation completes, and the value of it, the, the result value will be the string that gets returned. So that, that's the fundamental uh, asynchrony mechanism in .NET these days. In most system uh, APIs, interfaces are, are moving towards that direction because in, in multi-core parallel world, you have to be asynchronous uh, to be efficient. Uh, uh, and in distributed world, it's just a given. Everything is asynchronous. 
So if you look at this, there are a couple methods, get name, set name, right? So one is void, one is uh, one that returns a string. And then get friends, so it's just the social network kind of example where I have a user that has friends. So the get friends, you see it returns the task for a list of I user, even though I user is the interface we're defining. So even though it's a, a, a remotable interface in the end, we can use uh, uh, this kind of references uh, in code uh, freely, which is also pretty convenient. Likewise, at when uh, it takes an I user as, as an argument, and we'll see how it's used. So once you define the interface uh, and compile it, um, the code generation tool will automatically generate uh, a factory class with these kind of key methods. Um, get grain is really what, what we're after. So get grain takes uh, identity of, of the grain in, in, in the space of that type, in this case, the user grain type. And by default, or un under the covers, it's a GUI. It's a 16 byte, uh, um, the byte array, essentially. And long is just a shortcut, so you can pass a long integer, which will be internally turned to GUID with half of the GUID being zero. So it's really the same API, just for convenience, you can pass, uh, you can use integers as uh, identifiers if that's convenient. And cast we can ignore for now, but that, that's how you, you convert a referen grain reference to different interfaces um, between themselves. So this is how you, you call the grain method in, in our example. So the first line, which is kind of broken in two lines, uh, it calls this get grain factory method and passes the user ID, which uh, we presume we obtained somehow either uh, from a URL user pass or through uh, some token that the user authenticated and our authentication procedure returned. It, it doesn't matter. So we have some user ID, we pass, we get a reference. Me is, is a grain reference, it's kind of a proxy object that we get. Um, and the important thing to understand performance-wise that this is a local operation, it doesn't make, send any messages. So when we get me, it's really the local uh, nanosecond uh, loan operation of that scale. And then I do another call, uh, another get green call, pass a different reference, mm -hmm. a different identity, get the reference to a friend that I want to add as a friend. Again, it's local operation, we, we don't need to wait for anything. And then the line after try is to invoke a method add friend uh, on reference to me, to my user grain, and then passing the argument, the friend, that they, I, I receive from my, my friend ID. So this is where things become asynchronous because this call to uh, add a friend, it, it may be sent to another machine. My grain may not be activated yet, so it may not be in, may not be in memory, so it may take time to uh, put it on one of the servers in the cluster. It may take time to read my state, my profile uh, from some database. So this operation is not local, it's a distributed, it has to be synchronous. So what add friend returns, if, if, uh, if we look back at the interface, add friend returns a task, right? So it's, it's a promise for a void result. So this call me add friend return a task, and what we do, this, this is the beauty of that net 12.5, we can just say await, meaning continue execution of this method asynchronously when, when this operation, asynchronous operation completes. So we write code as if we're executing block and thread uh, and, and doing everything synchronously, but in reality, we are not ho holding on, on this thread. We're releasing it to the system once we call a wait. Uh, so this is very important for performance. Uh, what's also interesting, if, if this promise that was returned by add friend, uh, uh, the terminology gets broken, meaning there is an exception, there is an error that is thrown in any kind of stage of this operation, the network communication, maybe this method that friend throws and say, you only have this, this friend, you cannot add. So it can be application level exception, it can be system level exception. So if an exception is thrown and not handled uh, somewhere down the line, it will be rethrown here by a weight. So we can put, that's why we can put try catch around, essentially try catch is around the weight. And if there's an exception, our catch block will be executed. But again, it will be executed asynchronously without blocking this thread uh, of execution. And it's just an example, we do catch and we do something. We don't have to catch it, we, we can just let it throw, uh, break this call because the exception would propagate it um, further um, up the stack, or kind of stack is horizontal because it will be propagated to the caller. So this is the basic construct that, that you use. You make a call, you get a promise back, and then you await um, and, and continue your operation. 
after uh, the operation that you're waiting for, awaiting, is done. So implementation is sort of just implementing uh, interface by a class that extends another um, uh, important thing, grain base is the base class for all grain uh, implementations. So you say I'm extending grain base and I implement, in this case, I user, but I may implement several other interfaces, just like with, with normal uh, object-oriented programming. Um, and it just, the implementation wise, TPL has this kind of weird syntax where in order to return a, a, a ready value, like I have, for example, name, right? So I don't need to wait for it. But in order to return task of a string, I need to do task that from result and, and pass that value that I already have. It has nothing to do with what it is, it's just how TPL works. So that's why I was hoping you would read up on, on TPL, look at samples. This is the standard TPL way of returning uh, concrete values. One thing we added in the release because we got, got tired of this task from result, we added task done dot done for void results. So if you're done with the operation, you didn't make any, any call to anybody, you're not awaiting anything. I just added a friend locally to my uh, list of, of friends, I can just return uh, task dot done uh, as, as a result task. And you see at the top, um, I have private variables, variables. One of them is the list of friends. And it's just a normal list that uh, I allocate. And as I tried to explain yesterday, I always have uh, exclusive access to these variables in my grain. I don't have to put log. Because if, if you have used all this um, .NET uh, collections or whatever they call it, uh, data structures like uh, lists or dictionaries, if you try to do a concurrent operation, you're enumerating uh, a list. And another thread tries to add to the list or remove from the list, you'll get an exception, a concurrent modification exception. Those kind of exceptions are not possible here because you always run on a single thread. So whatever you do, you do for each, you don't have to protect, you don't have to take a log. This is my private state. My name, my status, and then the list of my friends. So let's look at something more elaborate than just returning uh, static values. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I need to return essentially a composed uh, collection of status of, of my friends. And doing it in a very primitive way, but just building a string. Of course, you might want to generate HTML or XML or whatever, JSON, doesn't matter. You still need to enumerate your friends. You need to get their statuses and format them in, in, in a certain way. We don't care about format, formatting piece. So look at this code. Um, first, we allocate a list of tasks uh, and tasks of strings specifically. So we'll see um, why we need it. Then we do for each over the list of friends that, that, that we have uh, already in, in our private variable. And what we do on each of the friend in, in the list, we, we call get status for that friend. So get status returns the task of a string, the promise for a string result, which again is a synchronous operation. It will be completed sometime later, maybe milliseconds and maybe seconds, we don't know. So what we could do, we could await every single one of them. So put await here within, within the for each loop. But then what would happen, we would execute one request at a time. So we, would, we call one friend, get that friend's status, await uh, until we get it, then call the second friend, then the third friend. So we would execute this sequentially. So if, if my list has 1,000 friends and say one round trip, let's pick a number, is 10 milliseconds. So if we multiply 10 milliseconds by 1,000, it'll be 10 seconds for the whole operation because we're doing it sequentially. So that's not very efficient. That's not very good for user experience to, to do this kind of stuff, to uh, do something that we can do in parallel, uh, make, make it uh, sequential. So instead, you see we, we are adding this task of a string returned by get, get uh, status. We're adding it to the list of tasks, which is very cheap. It's just adding to local variable. So all of this is not waiting for anything. We just run the loop, send, in my example, 1,000 messages to 1,000 um, friends grains. And then what we do, uh, it's, it's another TPL um, feature. Uh, there's this task, the static method task.whenAll, which takes an I enumerable or list of, of tasks and returns a join task. So it joins all these tasks that we passed in this list and returns one that will be resolved when all of these tasks are complete. And if something is broken, it will be, it will, this join task will be broken with uh, one or more exceptions. So essentially, we implemented a fan out pattern where we, we fan out in parallel, pretty much in parallel, because this loop that sends messages that's very cheap, very fast. We send, in my example, 1,000 messages in parallel. 
then we're waiting for all of them. And if, if in my example, each call takes uh, 10 milliseconds, we'll be waiting roughly 10 milliseconds instead of 10 seconds, because we're waiting in parallel on all these calls that go to different machines, executed in parallel on different threads, even on individual machines. So we, we uh, leverage in parallelism the system here very explicitly. And then once this completes, we can enumerate over uh, this promises again, this task of a string that now we, we're sure they all resolve because they join task that result. And then we can extract the value by doing t dot result. We're extracting the actual string from each individual um, result uh, from a call. And, and in this primitive case, we just append a line, right? But of course, we, we can format it differently. And notice that we, we don't do any error handling here because if one of these calls fails, the uh, await will throw, which will essentially kill execution of this method, and whoever called this method will get an exception. So in this example, we don't want to stand in the way. We don't know what to do if one of the calls fail. We prefer to return it to the caller, for example, to the client, and indicate we fail to give you a uh, status of all friends. And if the client wants to retry, that's their business that will call again. So we don't have to put any error handling code, any error propagation code here. So this is one of the benefits of, of the model that allows you to minimize the amount of code you write. And the less code you write, uh, the fewer bugs you have. And in general, the metric I prefer in, in software development, but not how many lines of code some developer wrote, but how many lines of code he was able to remove from an existing uh, project. And, and this tool, uh, this programming model helps you not put those unnecessary or potentially a buggy code um, in, into your project in the first place. So just to stress the execution model. So execution is single threaded um, and it executes uh, the code and the method in the grain executes serially until it hits an await statement. So if there is no await then the whole method executes synchronously on the thread. But if there is a synchrony, a synchrony in execution, for example, calls to other grains or calls to storage uh, libraries or something like that, then we put a wait uh, to break execution, in this example, essentially in two blocks. So we call internally, we refer to these blocks as turns. So the first turn of execution of the method runs until we hit a wait. And the second turn will be executed sometime later on a different OS thread, most likely. But we can write this code as if it executes serially. By default, until a method execution completes, in this example, until the second turn completes execution, grain is uh, unavailable for additional calls. So for example, if you keep making calls to add friends or get statuses, they will not be executed in parallel by default, even if you have multiple turns. Even though you return a thread by calling a wait or having a wait in your code, the grain uh, execution returns a thread to the system but the system will not deliver any new requests until this one is done. So the grain is non reentrant You cannot execute two method calls, uh, not in parallel, but even interleave, where we execute the first turn of one call. Imagine we're getting three calls in, of this method in parallel from three different front ends. So the first call that starts executing will execute the first turn, but the other two calls will wait for the second uh, turn to complete. So this is not non reentrancy by default, where second and third call will be put on the queue and will wait until the second turn completes when the whole method uh, uh, completes its execution. There is a way to override and put reentry attribute on, on, uh, on the grain class and say, I want to be reentrant, which will change, uh, change the model, uh, the execution uh, mod in this case. So if you make this grain reentrant, this method reentrant, then what will happen if you get, in my example, three parallel calls to this method, the first turn of the first method will, will execute. Then it hits a wait, execution hits a wait, return the thread to the system, it will pick up the first turn of the second message, second request, will execute it, and most likely will pick up the first turn of execution of the third request of the same method. So calls, turns from different calls will be interleaved. It will still be single thread, it will still not run in parallel, but they'll be interleaved to execute uh, even in the single thread of guarantees, but from multiple calls. So this potentially is more, uh, is more responsive for, for the caller, but it's much difficult uh, for figuring out what state my grain is. So if, 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 I, if I start executing second turn, and I assume that the state of my grain is 
where I left it before I hit a wait. In the, in the re-entry case, that's not the case. I may have executed 100 other calls. Maybe my list of friends got completely changed. I, I, I can make no assumptions when I start re-entering execution of the second term. And that was the reason why we made re-entrant, uh, non re the default, so that th this challenge or complexity or, or error-prone uh, situations are, are less likely to happen. But if you know what you're doing, you can turn it off. So is it clear, does it make sense what I'm talking about the execution re -entrancy? Okay. So there's another facility uh, in, in, in the program model called observers. So it was added to allow clients, and again, by client we mean something that is not a grain, runs outside of the silo. Usually that's a web front end, like IES or some uh, non-IES HTTP um, listeners. So in the example of Halo, they needed to uh, watch the progress of a game in near real time with under second delay on the mobile device. So the mobile device, the phone application connects the front end and says I'm interested in seeing any updates to a particular game. So how do we deliver, we don't want this client to keep polling every few milliseconds, say anything change, anything change. We want to push updates to the client. But at the same time, client is not, client execution is not under our control. It may be, usually, if you use IES, it's under control of IES. So we don't control threading, we, we don't control execution. Client may go down. So we didn't want to block, make blocking calls to the client. So instead, you can send one-way messages, essentially, through a, uh, an observer interface. So it's very similar to the grain interface, except for you extend a different one, uh, iGrain observer, and the rules are different. Instead of method returning task, they return void. So the moment you, s you, you make a call, the message is sent, and that's it. You, you don't await anything. You don't know if it will succeed. There are no exceptions. It's just a way to send fire and forget messages. Um, on the client side, uh, there is, I don't think I'm showing, but there is a way to turn, you, you can implement this method with, this, uh, with just the .NET class. So it, it's not a grain class, obviously, because it runs on the client, it doesn't run uh, within the silo, but you can make an implementation of this method and then call one of the factory classes, that, uh, factory methods that we generate for this interface to turn it into what appears like a grain reference, and you can send it so that whoever posts this uh, updates over this interface will send it as if it's a grain. So I talked yesterday about activation, the act uh, question. So, so I, I talk, I think, at length about how uh, the virtual actors get activated, the grains get activated by the runtime on a, a, as need basis. So when, when there is something for a grain to do and there is no activation of the grain in the system, the system automatically creates it. And if it's uh, grain activation is idle over a set period of time, it will garbage collect it and, and deactivate it. So there are a couple of methods at the bottom. It's activated sync and deactivated sync. The virtual methods, you can override them. They, Effectively, they're, they're moral equivalents of constructor and destructor. So when, when the runtime constructs activation of a grain, uh, when it, for example, loads its state and everything, then it calls activity sync before any, any call is delivered to the grain. So this is your chance to go and talk to storage if you need to. This is a chance to initialize some data structure. This is a chance to notify somebody that, oh, I, I got activated. I'm, I'm 
uh, online now to send me something if needed. And once activated sync, which is also asynchronous method, returns a task. So once that execution of activated sync completes, then whatever message triggered activation of grain will be delivered the method uh, on, on um, the, the object uh, instance of the class, which is a grain, will be invoked. And likewise, there is deactivated sync. Uh, so when we uh, deactivate a grain, we kind of call it, we, it's kind of your last chance to do something before we remove you from memory. Um, it, people ask if, if that's the right place to save your state, persist to database or, or some storage. And the answer is no, that's not the right place because we want to build for the cloud, because we build for failures. You may not ever get called, the deactivated sync may never get called in case that that silo, that machine dies. So you cannot rely on, on clean deactivation. So this is one of these aspects where when you program for the cloud, you program for failures. You expect anything can fail. And so deactivated sync is, usually people don't use it, uh, but sometimes they use it to notify that I'm going offline, don't send me a notification, for example. So it's more for bookkeeping internally within the application and not for state management. Unlike activated sync, because it's guaranteed that activated sync is called because that's when we activate, and you can rely on that on loading state. So it's it's asymmetric, uh, sort of. So activated sync, as I mentioned, can decide to load state from say database and then initialize internal state. And whenever somebody calls and says add the friend, so that method, the implementation of add friend, can write this change to database or, or to some column store, say, hey, I just added, I changed my, my friend list. So you can do all of that in, in your code. Uh, in addition, there is a facility to do it um, more, more declaratively through the built-in support for persistence. And, and the support for persistence is implemented in such a way that you declare your contract, your, your state interface, again, this I, Grain state is, again, the marker interface for your state, which is just a property back, a set of properties that you declare. This is my state that I want to have in the persistent storage. So this is persistent state, uh, which does have to be equal to your in-memory state. It's an option. You can just have this persistent state, the property back, and that's all the state you have. But you have full freedom, in addition to that, to have some in-memory so-called soft state that you're okay to lose if you say machine dies or uh, whatever happens. So it's, it's up to the applications. You're not constrained. First of all, you're not forced to use this, this model. You can completely ignore uh, declarative persistence. But if you choose to use it, you're not constrained by using just uh, uh, the state interface for, uh, for persistence or for, for, for your state in general. Uh, and then it works uh, by, so you, you, you annotate your class by the storage provider attribute and say, this class, I want to be handled by a storage provider with the string name that you define in a config file. So this allows you to, to completely make it configuration driven. For example, you have different storage accounts for, uh, for development, for testing, for production. So instead of hard coding things like that, so they go to config and then you just map the name, uh, map them with the name between config and, and your application. So in this case, uh, provider, my storage provider, that's what I use for this class. Uh, there are two built-in providers that are in the SDK. Uh, one memory store called dev store in, in, in config. This is just for uh, development. So you, you're testing, debugging your application locally. You don't want anything to be persistent because you want to restart and, and have it clean. You don't want to keep cleaning after every run. Uh, and the other one is for, it's kind of very simplistic implementation, Azure, uh, Azure table provider which will persist either to your um, local emulator, Azure emulator, hope you familiar with Azure emulator uh, by now, or to the actual uh, cloud uh, storage in Azure table. Uh, but but it's, uh, the, uh, the system is open, so you, there's the interface for providers, so it, people implemented already a bunch of other providers for a blob store for some database I've never heard of, RavenDB. So it, Point is, this is the, um, the extensibility point in the system. You can add providers and integrate with different uh, storage systems. And this is just a glimpse in, into how storage providers are defined in the configuration file. So you, you, you specify uh, this specified type, and then you just put your assembly with provider implementation in the same folder, and 
at, at silo startup, we will find through reflection all the providers and, and will interpret the config the right way. So if, if you, if you um, say that you want to use persistence, Yeah, so what, what I missed here, when, when you want to use declarative persistence, instead of extending green base, you extend green base of T, where T is your, your state interface. In this case, green base of I, my green state defined above. So when you do that, um, what you get is a state property on, on the base class. And green base implementation will have a state property of that type, that interface that you define. And then state also exposes three methods, write state, async, read state, async, and, and clear state. In most cases, you only need the first one. Because when, when we activate a grain, the runtime will load state effectively called read state, async, on the behalf of the grain, and will populate this property back. And by the time we call activate async, the state is already there in memory. So you don't need to write any code for that. Um, and then when, when there's any material change to, to the state that you want to persist, you call write state async. And, and checkpoint essentially a state to the storage. So in most cases, you just use one method, write state async. Read state async makes sense only if there is a possibility of somebody changing state, uh, not through the grain, but through some other means, like DBA going and changing. Um, so in this case, you may need to refresh. So read state async essentially refreshes its property back. And clear um, uh, option was added, and people were concerned, oh, if, if I don't need this grain anymore, how do I remove it from storage? With cloud storage, it's usually not a big deal. There is no need to clean up because it's so cheap. It's much better in most cases to keep all the data and not delete it. But some people are concerned we added a clear, um, a clear option. It's up to the provider what it does. Marks this, this uh, row in the database as deleted or actually deletes it. It's up to the provider implementation. So another facility that it's, is very popular um, uh, timers. So a grain uh, activation, usually in the activated sync or when it receives a, a particular method call, can set up a timer and then uh, make it call its, its method, its private or public method. Uh, the API there is identical to setting up a .NET timer. Uh, the only difference is uh, you do it through Orleans runtime, which guarantees um, threading. Uh, so you still single thread it. If we just use .NET timer, timer would fire on different thread, and you would potentially have a um, multi-threaded situation, which we don't want. So effectively, that, that's a thin wrapper on top of .NET timer that just marshals uh, the timer tick to um, the execution queue of the grain. And timer uh, lifecycle is limited, or the scope of, uh, of it is limited by the grain activations. So when grain is activated, if it created some timers, they will leave until this grain is deactivated. And if, say, grain is idle, doesn't do anything, gets deactivated, timers will be gone uh, with, with the activation. So they're not the reliability mechanism. Uh, reminders uh, are persistent timers. So they get written to um, persistent store, and they can fire uh, at the set period of time whether a grain is active or not, which is very useful and very good for reliability. So, one example where it, 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 it's useful from a performance perspective, if you need to do some, say, bookkeeping backup, say, every 24 hours. So every day you want to execute some method, do some operation. With timer, you would have to stay in memory the whole 24 hours, which doesn't make any sense. You, you have nothing to do. You just need once a day go and check something, refresh, backup, whatever you need to do. So reminder is a facility to do that. So you register reminder to fire, say, 24 hours, and then you don't care whether uh, there are any calls to your grain. When the reminder ticks, the message will be sent to the grain, will get activated, and will execute that method. We were surprised one, one implementation we didn't think about, that, but uh, our external customers found, they build workflows with that. So say, my, my workflow grain will encapsulate certain process, certain business process, and I wanted to to check it, the state of workflow every half an hour. So they set up a reminder, it fires, checks if there any progress, you get approval from uh, something. If not, we're, we're, we're okay to sleep for another half an hour. Uh, so it's, it's a very um, convenient uh, thing for that. Reliability is another scenario where 
Uh, if something fails and there are no requests to Ugrain, it has no chance to, to do something. For example, you process the last request. This is what we discussed with Halo. So when the last message from uh, a game comes in, and during processing the message, uh, the machine dies. How do we know that we, how do we, we complete that process? So the solution is set a reminder. So each grain, when it begins execution, uh, sets a reminder. Uh, and then if, if it dies in the middle, reminder will fire sometime later and it will see, did I finish execution uh, processing the state? And if, if I did, just do the reminder, I'm done. If not, I have a chance to um, retry this operation or redo it. So the kind of both performance optimization and, and the reliability mechanism and I can, in case of workflow, just, just general um, application uh, programming uh, facilities. So hosting, uh, silos really are, are objects. So silo is, is, is an object of a particular class of the runtime. And technically they can be hosted anywhere. Uh, the limitation today at least is the one silo per app domain. Uh, so for example, for testing purposes, it's very handy to have multiple silos started in different app domains of the same process and client the caller to, to the grains to be in the same process in, in its own app domain. So they can test effectively a distributed system within a single process. You can touch the debugger and stop the whole system, which you cannot do with in a distributed case. Um, in production, in most cases, you, you run one silo per, per machine. So just the process that encapsulates um, a silo, silo object and, and starts and runs. But you can also run multiple, uh, for example, for upgrade cases, you can run one silo most of the time, but then start a new version and shut down the old one. So all these uh, things are possible. Uh, there is no application deployment step. So it's just X copy style deployment. You put your grain assemblies in, in the folder and subfolder of applications. Um, and when the silo starts, it inspects all the binaries and finds your application, uh, the grain classes, the grain interfaces uh, at the start of time. So there's no need to install a register or anything. Just, just drop your binaries and they will work. And as I explained, I think yesterday, silo code takes care of establishing a cluster. So long as configuration is correct, you set the same deployment ID to all your silos, uh, they will form a cluster automatically, or I should say automatically. So in, in, in Azure, that's even simpler. So we include a default host. So linsco.exe is, is a default host that hosts one silo within the main app domain. And that's what makes sense to use for non-Azure deployments. When you run your local machine and there is local silo um, deployment in the, as part of the SDK, so you just start this linsco.exe and it starts a silo. Uh, if you deploy a non-Azure environment in, on the premises, on, on your cluster of, of servers that you have, that, that's the host you can use by default. Or you can build your own host process by encapsulating or, or, but having code that instantiates uh, the Orleans or the silo object. So host, all it does, it reads config and configures the silo and instantiates it, say, run. That's it. Uh, the resolution for cluster state was sort of non-traditional, so instead of implementing Paxos and all those complex algorithms that even most advanced people cannot get right, we outsource this problem to Azure Table. So Azure Table uh, acts as a, as a source of truth for the cluster state. So when the silo starts, it goes and reads, by using uh, deployment ID as the key, goes and reads what's the state of my cluster. And it finds all the nodes that are already there. Um, and then if it's the first one, it just adds itself. I'm the first one in, in this cluster. If, if it's not the first one, then it finds a list of existing silos and tests that it can connect uh, over the network with each one of them. And if it can, then it joins the cluster. And through that table, they also vote on silos that they cannot achieve this suspect or uh, cannot reach to run, uh, silos at runtime, suspect that silo may be dead. So all the suspicions, these votes for um, the death of a silo, they go into the same table. Uh, and that's how they coordinate through the table. Because Azure Table is already highly available, replicated, so we just um, use that uh, features of it. 
coincidentally, it's also convenient for, for developers. So you wonder what state of my cluster, just go open the, um, the table uh, in, in any of the tools, even the built-in Visual Studio tool, and you see what's going on. Do you have five silos that are all active? Do you have dead silos? When did it die? Who voted that it's dead? So it's all um, easy to, to investigate what's going on. So clients, as I mentioned several times, are things that run outside of, of a silo. So usually it's a front end. Uh, it can be IS, it can be Katana, uh, HTTP listener, or, or anything else. Uh, the client also has a configuration file, just like a silo, but a much, much simpler configuration file. And it's given the same, uh, essentially, data about uh, deployment ID and, and where to find uh, information about the cluster. And, and once you initialize the client, it's part of initialization of the client, it goes, reads this data, and, and connects to one or more silos that are available there. So from, from the client programming perspective, you just write uh, Arlene's client dot initialize, and, and everything happens there. So just single line to initialize the whole runtime on the client. And then it works, the program model is exactly the same as you saw, get grain and make a call to grain, and wait call. Uh, also, if, if silo goes, silos go down, the state of uh, the cluster changes in the table, client can understand and reconnect connect to those uh, silos that are there. So you can reboot your whole cluster and the client will stay connected because it will dynamically uh, uh, reconnect to other nodes in the cluster. So as long as your deployment is running in some, some way, at least a single uh, silo is there. So Azure is kind of very natural map for, for this model where you have Worker role is, is a natural um, host type where you have worker role in multiple instances of it. So you deploy worker role with the code of the silo, the code of your, your, your grain assemblies and configuration file with deployment ID. Uh, and Azure uh, fabric control starts multiple instances of that role, role instances, and they start in multiple silos that find each other. Clients can be run as, uh, the simplest thing is to run as part of the web role. Uh, which is IES based, but you can also run a uh, worker role uh, for different kind of setups, for example, with your custom HTTP listener, or if your source of data, your input comes, say, from a, a service bus. So you can, you can start a worker role, all it, do, all it does goes to service bus, reads messages, and then makes calls to grains, interprets the identity of, of the receiving grain and sends it. So it, it's very flexible, you can do whatever you want. And it, Kind of this, this slide stresses that you make sure your binaries get copied uh, because that, that's the deployment model for application. Uh, the Azure config, I, I don't know how much you got into this part of the training, but you need to uh, configure a couple of endpoints. So one is internal, uh, as I was showing yesterday. The one TCP port we open is for silo to silo communication. That's the first endpoint, I think by once as the default port number. So it's internal endpoint. And then the other one is also internal for clients, front ends to connect. So we don't expose clients into the wild on the internet because they're supposed to run a trust environment. So that's why you usually put a front end that receives terminates HTTP connections, HTTPS connections, and then um, forwards these calls to grain. So nothing very difficult here. Uh, if you look at worker role code, if it's part of your training, this should look familiar when you implement your work role. So it's font is too small, but you have on start, run, and on stop, three events. So in, in, in on start, you just uh, prepare when it says run, you just you run silo, and when you shut down, you stop the silo. So it's very straightforward. I'll probably skip through most of the details of a diagnostic, but there is a lot of logging internally in the system. There's a lot of trace information and you can configure different levels of it. You can intercept this information, you can redirect it to many other ways. So it, it supports all the standard ways of consuming log, but it can also log through the same um, trace, uh, trace source uh, from the application, which makes debugging much easier when, when you have traces that include system and application messages uh, all in the same place. There's also a lot of instrumentation where uh, the runtime itself keeps track of two or 300 metrics internally. Most of them don't make sense for the application programmer, but they get written to uh, Azure table as well by default. 
that, that helps understand what's going on. When people say, oh, my application runs fine for four hours and then something happens, my throughput drops. So by looking at the history of, of the statistics, it's possible to understand what the trends were, what was changing. It's a very powerful tool to um, figure out what's going on. And that's the last slide I have, but I wanted to show you the demo. So maybe I can take a few questions now if something is burning, or we can switch to the demo right away. Okay, more questions? Let me just. Sorry? I think the plan is to, to publish all the slides on the website. Is, is that true, Dennis? Sorry? Uh, are we going to publish slides? Yeah, we will, we will get the slides and try to get them onto the uh, website. Soon. If somebody asked me to send slide, email slides from yesterday and email it, so, but they'll be published. Okay, let me set it up. A question? So the question is about using dot, uh, Arlene's without languages. It's limited to .NET because it's kind of built on .NET. So whatever you can run in .NET, for example, f or vb.net, they work. Um, so if you're familiar with Java, I think transitioning to c -sharp, it, it's a very minor effort. It, they're very similar uh, managed runtime. I, I would say that c -sharp is cleaner than Java, so it should be even enjoyable to, to move. <laughs> So it's, it's not difficult. We've, we've seen people just picking it up in no time, even though it was, there was the first uh, C sharp experience. Okay. Okay. So because I couldn't find the adapter, I have to use a surface, a small screen surface that Dennis provided me. It'll be a little bit slower than I hope, but I think you'll, you'll get the point. So I'll, I'll, I'll just for the sake of time, I, I'll cheat a little bit. So I'll show you first um, the experience of creating new projects. So when, when you create a new solution, just with any other <clears throat> Visual Studio projects, you go to, in this case, use C Sharp. And since I installed the SDK on, on this machine, there are these three project templates at the bottom of, of the list. Should be at the top, but they're at the bottom. Uh, so the first one is, is, is Grain Interface Collection. So let's put it in some name. So we're creating a first project called Demo Interfaces. And that this project template, it contains uh, configuration to, to, to hook up code generation and also some snippet of code to start from. Question? Uh, no, not yet. Well, that's mostly server-side code, so Bryant on the phone doesn't make a lot of sense. Calling from phone does make sense, but in that case, you probably want to call over HTTP anyway for security and other reasons. So I think there is, I don't see much reason to run it on the phone, to be honest. So Silas uh, is supposed to run uh, supposed to run continuously, and power efficiency of that would be very terrible. So I, I'm not convinced <laughs> you'll get much. Oh wait, what happened? I think I picked the wrong template. That's not what I wanted.
think I didn't click on, on the project template. Okay, migraine pieces. So we can we can ignore delete this uh, text comments that just to save space. Um, so it, it put the interface named it, and for example, I, I, I can name it differently. I can say I want to do a I want to build an application for devices, manage device information. I can name it I uh, I device uh, add some method. set state pass something. Um, and then I'll add another project. Uh, now of the grain class collection. So interfaces and class, the grain class is defined in two different projects. Is have different code generation and different dependency. So let's call it grains. So when you do that, you also get kind of a template for what to do. Um, let's compile interfaces first because we need we need uh, the factory methods generated, and we need to add the reference. Finish. So as you would expect, the implementation classes need to reference the, the interface uh, project. All right, so we have the reference here. And now we can say this is going to be our device grain class that will implement uh, I device. I think that's what it called. Device. To resolve because of namespaces, yeah, and we can say implement. So I put a stub of this, this method here. So like like you would do with any other interfaces or classes in non-release scenario. So the third project type, project template. Okay, so the third one, dev test host, this is optional. This is just the simplified development where it, all it does, it starts uh, the silo uh, in, in the app domain and then starts your client code in the same process that helps debugging. I'll show you this in action. Uh, but I wanted to show you first the experience of adding a project with the project templates. So you see it, it also puts to some kind of boilerplate code that you can mostly ignore. You see the line, Orleans client dot initialize. This is how client is initialized, and then points to config file and everything. And then where these comments are, we can put any logic uh, we want on the client. So we, how it works, we, we add references to this. This silo host project needs references uh, to both interfaces and implementation so that all these things get deployed and, and can be used. So we just add set two checkboxes. And after that, it will deploy, um, it will deploy our grain implementation to local silo. I should show you this. So this is where SDK uh, gets installed to the, by default. It's Microsoft Codename Orleans SDK. And in the SDK folder, there is a local silo folder. So this is where uh, Orleans host that exe is and, and all the dependencies and config files and everything. And you see the applications folder is where you deploy um, your application binaries. So local silo is exactly the same code as in production. So you can test what exactly going to run um, in real life. 
And you can start a local silo with just the batch file. So we'll start at the console app. And the silo will initialize. The bunch of tracing there uh, in the system, but you can ignore it for now. Yeah, and it says, I started. So the silo is ready. So you can start it manually, or this dev test host project um, automates this whole thing, so you don't have to do it manually. And now I'll switch to another solution that I was writing as I was sitting in the morning. So I, I put together a simple solution just for the sake of time and show you what I, what I have there. So there are three projects that you see. Uh, test interface is test grains and test is dev test host. So the same three project types. So in the interfaces, interfaces.cs, I define a few data types like this enum for device state. Uh, like in, in any application, I can define types. I defined my device data as just a, a, a container class for, in this case, three properties. And then I define my interface that uses this. So I device has get device data, returns device data, set device data. So imagine that's a sensor, this seismic sensor that is in the field, sends data periodically over the network. So it would just call uh, set device data on, on, on the grain to send update to the state. Uh, in this case, I use temperature, humidity. Um, and I also define a, a device hub interface. So like say this is thermostats and they group by room or, or by building. So the hub is what uh, combines several devices right, related to each other, for example, in the same room. Uh, in this case, you can get a list of devices, you can register a device, and you can unregister a device. So the, the, the purpose of it is that when device gets activated, it can register itself with a hub. All right, so hope this all makes sense. Um, and let's look at grain code. So device grain, this is the one that gets messages, say, from a thermostat. The activated sync, as, as I mentioned, is kind of like a constructor. So each grain has a primary key, and it, it, either GUID or long, or it can be extended with a string. In this case, I use, I'm using the longs just because they're integers for simplicity. So the first thing I do, I extract what is my identity, what is my uh, integer. And then I added this simplistic helper function to figure out which hub I belong to. Uh, for example, which is the room controller. Uh, and, and I just put, I divide my ID by 10, right? But it can be a lookup function, some configuration to see that this device needs to talk to this hub, uh, this controller. Uh, then you see a couple of lines of using uh, this logging uh, tracing facility. I just call get logger on, on the base class, uh, add uh, a marker essentially for my uh, log messages. And then I can log right away. I can say info, there's also warning and error uh, methods on the logger. And then see, I'm, I'm calling my hub. I, I, uh, I did get hub, uh, which returns uh, the hub, the device hub uh, the reference. And then I call it register me. So I'm starting being activated, going online, register me. So if there are any commands for me, I'm notifying me. For this kind of scenarios. So this is our kind of constructor. So I keep my state in, in the uh, private variable. Uh, underscore data, so when somebody calls get device data, I just return a copy of it with task form result. If somebody, it's my device sends me this data, I just update my variable. It's a very simplistic case, and I'm done. And if somebody asks for my, uh, my hub, my controller, I just return private variable that I have. So that, that's all the basic logic. There's nothing fancy here. Um, and I also have device hub grain. So it has a little bit similar logic in, in its activated sync method. So I initialize internal variables, then I get my identity, my hub identity. I initialize logger, say that I'm activating. And again, I have a private, private variable with a list of devices that I return somebody asks. And if, if I receive a request from a device to register, I just check, do I already have this, list, this device in, in my uh, hash set? And if not, then I'll add it. And when a device asks to unregister, I do the opposite. So like I mentioned, in deactivated sync, device grain can call and say, call its hub and say, remove me, unregister me, I'm going down uh, for now. So again, hopefully it's very straightforward. There's no rocket science here. And to test this, 
I created a dev test host project. So all this boilerplate that got uh, created by template, and you see between those Orleans client dot initialize and uh, enter to terminate, I, I put a few lines of code. So I just added a simple loop, loop over 20 devices and, and set their state to some temperature, humidity, programmatically. Um, and that's all I need. So when I, when I hit a five, uh, the dev test So this is what dev test host project starts, just a console window that hosts both client and, and the silo. So first silo gets initialized, and you can ignore all of this. It may not make sense, but you can see, for example, what grain types they discovered. So if something isn't working, you can see, did it find my grain class? Maybe I didn't make it public. Maybe there's some other problem. So it's a useful um, uh, information gets written to a file by default. And so see what happens. So we, we're looping over, uh, we have a, a loop of 20 integers and, and we send, set state of devices from zero to 19 in this case. And they activate hub implicitly. The first device grain, it calls its hub to register and that triggers activation of the hub. You see the first message is from device grain and second from device hub grain uh, that's activating and their identity. So as you may wonder, there's no parallelism here, right? So everything happens sequentially, one after another, very orderly. That's not what we want in the cloud, right? And this is why, because I, I added this t.wait uh, after every call. So this is the case where I'm not using fan out, I just do one step at a time, just show uh, initialization sequence. So if I remove this line and do as I was explaining with the fan out um, a few minutes ago. So I, I, I loop over all the device grain references, make calls to them all in parallel effectively, and then do join all or when all on this task and await the task. The execution should be very different. So again, silo starts, brings all this. For example, first it's, it dumps the config, so you can look at config values and see what configuration you started with. And it's slow because it's just the surface. It's much faster on, on real hardware. <clears throat> now look what happened. So first of all, there is no order. So we activate in device grain 17 first, and then 18, 19. So that proves that those calls to grain, uh, to device grain to set their device state, they really went in parallel with no order. And they arrived in, in, in some non-deterministic order. But you also notice this, this error after device grain three says, um, what? No, that's the wrong. Uh, one after device grain six, try to create a duplicate activation. So remember I talked yesterday about this challenge of multiple callers in parallel trying to access the same actor and figuring out, does it exist, do I need to create it, where I create it, how do I register it? So this is many, a manifestation of this problem, but it's also all about the runtime. So runtime just puts an info message saying, I had this concurrent request to, to activate the same grain from two sources. In this case, that's the hub grain because two device grains in parallel try to talk to the same uh, device hub grain. So they, they compete for it and they talk to different, they make different decisions about placement and then that gets reconciled by the runtime. So it's a manifestation the problem exists, but it's solved by the runtime. You don't see the application code. So in the end, you end up with, with a single device hub activation, not with two, and you don't have to write any code for that. So I guess that's all we have time for, but I hope you see that it's very easy to write code. It's very easy to run and test and, and understand what's going on, and it's very real, like parallelism is there, even on the surface that is not really the right hardware for this task. So any questions after this?
Yes, great question about unit tests. So we published on, on Kotlex side that one of the samples is the unit test uh, solution where leveraging this fact that silo can be started in, in uh, the app domain, uh, it starts by default two silos, but it can start more, it starts the client. And that's actually how we run uh, 700 plus of a unit test uh, with every build. It's very easy to use. Anything else before we go to lunch? No, I have some things to talk about. Okay. okay. I received uh, in my email uh, responses from 12 groups. So I don't think I've got everybody yet. Uh, I will publish a list. If you haven't sent me a uh, team you know, document, definition of who the team is and, and what you're going to do, I think you need to do that. Uh, after launch, if you're not sure yet, some, some people are not sure exactly what they're going to do. Uh, the instructors will all be here. And we will meet with each team individually uh, that wants to meet with Some teams, by the way, I noticed, are already really rolling along and may not need much consultation. Uh, other teams are still trying to figure out exactly what to do. Uh, but anyway, we will be here uh, and we will just start meeting with teams. So there's four or five of them. And, uh, and we're looking forward to those discussions. Any other questions about that and the process? Okay. Just one note, if you pick the, uh, one of the projects or your project using Orleans, then look at carefully the project description ah. because it has all the steps for all the uh, things you need to install and check and linked to the step-by-step -step guide how to configure so you don't spend any time on known or configuration tools. Also, we will put all the slides for all the talks on the OneDrive, and uh, so I need to get yours and, and Paul's and Jeffrey uh, uh, and Sergey back there as a OneDrive thing. Is that is that the URL for that thing? Uh, uh, this is the URL for entire folder and we'll send everybody an email where that is. We'll let you know that right after.